This is the image of Kate Marsden that first got me hooked on her story. She appears as this fabulous female Indiana Jones figure riding astride, which in itself was really unusual for a woman at that time. She's dressed in a full leather outfit, complete with a skirt to cover her modesty. On one side, she's got a revolver, on the other is lashed a whip, and she's leading a team of at least a dozen flint-hard Yakut Cossacks, also on horseback, and they're about to head out together into the unknown. And this really was the unknown. The year is 1891 and we're in the remotest part of the vast Russian Empire. Nobody came here apart from a handful of government officials, the odd missionary and those that were sent into exile. And look at how she was travelling on the back of a Yakut horse, which may be small in stature, but is really wild in spirit and using a traditional Yakut saddle, which is made of wood. Even if you cover this thing in blankets, it's going to be incredibly uncomfortable. Add to that the bears and the rough terrain. This is the vision of a woman that I'm prepared to admire as a hero. This formidable looking woman wasn't an explorer. She was a nurse on a mission. She traveled all the way from her native London, a journey that had already taken her months to get here to Yakutia. And now she was about to head out into the trackless taiga, the wilderness. And this is as wild as it comes. Even today, traveling to this part of the Russian Far East is pretty intimidating. Imagine doing that a century ago when there were no safety nets, no travel insurance, no one coming to rescue you if anything went wrong. There was really no way home for her. She was a lone British woman a long way from home. My name is Kola. I am 17. Несомненно, Кет Марзин оставил незабываемый след в истории Вилюйского и не только Вилюйского, но и всего республики. В далекие времена она была сестрой милосердия. Она лечила людей, она также лечила всех во время войны. Кейт Мартин Ден, сестра милосердия Волар, Англия, Курда Карахсиртен, Вилюге, Айнангель Бита, Гарахана, Яна Тулуян. Бихиколиш Патагар, Киньяхан, Анлах, Стипендия Вар. Еще Дюкюр, Нерна, Учни, Юлия, Нанджарик, Танар, Оларга, Олар, Стипендия, Анлар. Кет Марстен, Кет Марстен, сестра Милосердия, Ей Куртук, Саха Сильгер, Калян, Саэ, Отекордан, Энтехотом, Мулю, Улугар, Калян, Сосновка. Проказа Ирла Джаннору Калян МТВТА. Кине Сахотох Джан Сахотох Сахотох Калян МТВТА Джаннору. Сосновка Улебет Англичанка. Англия Танкальбет Медик Верахтах Брас. Она Сир Сир Сирихинен Тох МПО Кардавит Она Манна Белюга Кальбет. Он на сосновках говорил, лахтаром братан, а раны лахтаром хомой вот он на МТВЦ. Ты инча, а гости себя гонтак сусилга, он их смай готовит. А раны лах, да не ран МТВЦ. Бе, кине блюга колен, то церков тут тарбута, а раны рине МТВЦ. Он на Эльбах и Тюнингон будто бы эти вот были я охтах только. Она столкнулась с болезнью, которую можно было вылечить с травой, которая растет в Вилюйском улусе, да? Ага. Она узнала, что эта трава растет в Вилюйском улусе и направилась сюда. По пути она находилась в сложном пути. Она Проключений было у нее достаточно, так скажем. Kate Marsden herself explains the story in her writings and in newspaper articles. She talks about being still a very young nurse when she first came across someone who had leprosy. And she describes being so shocked by the awfulness of the disease that she decided there and then that this was going to be the cause that she would devote her life to. It was while researching the latest and most modern methods of looking after people that had contracted leprosy that she first heard a rumour 
a rumour about a magical herb that was used by a specific people in a very far-flung part of the world, the very northeast of Siberia. This was a place where nobody went apart from condemned convicts and very hardy explorers. And yet on hearing this rumour about this people, the Yakut, that had a magical herb that could apparently cure leprosy as well as all sorts of other disorders, she makes the radical decision that she herself is going to go to this edge of the world and find this herb. And not only that, but she's going to convince these people who are apparently very secretive about the healing powers to let her bring this herb, this magical cure, to the rest of the world. Now, even today, in 2020, it's pretty intimidating making the journey all the way here to this unknown corner of Siberia. I can't imagine what it must have been like for her and how scary this must have been. We're here now with travel insurance, with plan Bs, knowing that if something goes terribly wrong, we can get home pretty quickly. She wouldn't have had any of that. She had no way back. Arriving in Yakutsk, she was confronted with this exotic culture and with a wildness that I imagine she had probably never experienced before. This place is intimidating to anybody. And yet arriving in Yakutsk, she started to hear not just of the herb, but of the people that had contracted leprosy and that were outcasts in this wild taiga, not being cared for by anybody. So she decides that having reached the end of the world, she's going to go even further. She gets on her horse, she arranges a, she arranges a company of mounted Yakut Cossacks. These are as hard as they come, they're flint hard. And yet there she is, the only woman in this party of 30, heading off into the Tega to this place, Filowisk, a tiny little village. The journey here was not easy. As extreme as Yakutia is now in the middle of winter, it's equally as extreme in the summer. As extreme as Yakutia is in winter, it's equally extreme in summer. So we have temperatures right now down to minus 40 degrees centigrade in winter. In summer it can be plus 40 degrees centigrade. Imagine being in that heat on horseback, dressed in a full leather outfit to protect you from the biting ticks and the mosquitoes. Ticks which carry a disease that can paralyze you within 24 hours. She was riding with a group of men who were used to this environment. Every night she'd have to sleep on the ground under a small canvas tent and they were surviving off of rations of dried bread and tea. It was no pleasure trip. Yeah. Arriving in Yakutsk, at the very end of the world. She's given a sample of the herb that she came here looking for. So job done, you think, she could be on her way home. But while there, she hears of the plight of the local people that have contracted leprosy. They're outcast into this wild taiga with nobody looking after their welfare. So she decides that rather than go home, she's going to carry on and plunge herself deeper into the taiga, further into the unknown, to find these people and find out for herself what their situation is. Arriving in Villoisk, she made trip after trip back out into that terrifying nature. This is a place that's full of real and imagined dangers. Not only are there bears and insects, but the people that she was with would have believed that these forests were full of spirits, some good and some very bad. This was a whole new landscape. And in those woods, already terrifying, she came across horrendous nightmares. People that had been cast out of their society, who were not only dealing with a terrible illness, but also with the fact that they'd been separated from their families, that they'd been disgraced, humiliated, knowing that they would never see their families, friends, societies, communities again, and that they would die out there alone in the woods. Horrible, lonely deaths. She describes again and again the scenes that she witnessed of small groups of people huddled together in the woods, desperately trying to survive. And it's obvious that she was incredibly affected by it. But what exactly was this disease? What is it now? And what was it then?
Leprosy isn't just an awful disease, it's a cruel one. The first symptoms are usually lesions on the skin, followed by a thickening of the nerves so that you can't feel your extremities. Your muscles deform so that you become severely disabled. Then nodules might appear around your nose and mouth and your earlobes so that you become very disfigured. But throughout all of this, it doesn't affect your brain capacity and it doesn't even have to affect your life expectancy. You could live for decades while your body slowly disintegrates. This is a disease that wasn't understood in Kate Marsden's time. It was incorrectly thought to be highly contagious, when in fact 95% of the population is naturally immune. In fact, we now know that you have to live very closely with someone that has leprosy for a very long period of time before you're at risk of catching it. Today, you can get treatment free from the World Health Organization, no matter where you are in the world. But back then, the only treatment was to expel someone who was showing the symptoms of leprosy. And in Siberia, that meant exile into the forest. If you were lucky, someone might be willing to leave you food and clothing by a nominated tree, but otherwise you were left to your own devices. Not only were people scared of catching the disease, they were scared because leprosy was so awful they believed it must derive from a curse. Even the Christian church preached that leprosy was a curse from the devil. It's one thing to hear a rumour of a magical herb in a distant part of the world. It's quite another to make the radical decision that you're personally going to go and find it yourself. Especially seen as others had already been and failed. Marsden was confident that if she went to the people of Yakutia with the message that she didn't want the herb for herself but for the good of all, as she put it in the name of Christ, she also thought that the fact she was a woman would be an advantage. But she did have one truly remarkable ace up her sleeve. A stroke of luck that fell into her lap and that she made maximum use of. A letter from the Tsarina, the Empress of Russia herself. And in this letter, the Tsarina commanded all the subjects of the Russian Empire to lend Marsden any assistance that she required on her quest. It's impossible to overstate the influence and authority this letter would have carried. It literally gave Marsden the ability to go anywhere, see and do anything she wanted. It gave her the freedom of the empire. How on earth did she manage to get this golden ticket of a letter? It's difficult for us to appreciate today just what an undertaking it was to travel to Yakutia. In modern times, I've made the journey from Moscow to Yakutsk in a vehicle. We drove more than 500 kilometers every day and the journey still took us more than a month. In 1891, Marsden could only go so far by train from Moscow. After that, she relied on horse-drawn sledges. These are unsprung, so she would have felt every bump, and they're completely exposed to the elements. At first, she traveled with a Russian-speaking friend, Ada Field, and the pair of them wore so many layers of blankets and furs that they were completely helpless once they were loaded into the back of the sledge. Marzen describes in quite some detail what she calls the horrors of the journey. For a start, there were the drivers, Often they were drunk, which wouldn't have helped, and they were in control of the sledge, and she describes them as being reckless. Frequently, they careered off the road so that the helpless passengers were dumped unceremoniously into the snow. At night, they slept in small post houses positioned along this basic trail. There weren't many facilities. They slept on the floor, and the place was crawling with lice and vermin. On one occasion while travelling at night, 
Marsden thought she was seeing the lights from campfires in the woods, so she asked the driver if they could stop to warm themselves for a bit. He replied that they weren't campfires, they were the eyes of wolves that were chasing the sledge through the woods. At some point it all became too much for Ada Field, who got so ill that she had to turn back. Marsden carried on alone and everywhere she stopped on this journey she insisted on being taken to the local prisons so that she could inspect the conditions and hand out small bags of tea and mini copies of the testament to all the convicts. She wasn't to know it but this strengthened suspicions that had already been established that her real mission was not compassion but espionage. She was accused of being a spy which at the time made a lot of sense. The British and Russian empires were locked into what was called the Great Game, genteel manoeuvring for the greater influence in Central Asia. If not for the patronage of the Tsarina, Marsden might not have been allowed to continue and would almost certainly have been stopped from having access to all the prisons. But the letter meant that she could go and see and do pretty much as she pleased. Today, her insistence on highlighting conditions in the prisons and of the convicts might be considered the actions of a human rights activist. And it makes me wonder, if she was alive today, who would she be comparable to? Then made her final journey home to London. She arrived to be fated as a heroine. She was showered with the highest accolades. She was made one of the first female members of the Royal Geographical Society. She was awarded a nursing medal, something she shared with Florence Nightingale. She was constantly quoted in the press with long interviews. And then she was invited into the drawing rooms of the elite, all who wanted to know every detail of her extraordinary journey. And then finally, the ultimate honour. She was granted an audience with Queen Victoria. Travelling to Balmoral, Kate dressed in her best nurse's uniform to meet with the monarch and personally report on what she'd found in Siberia. Queen Victoria must have been extraordinarily impressed because shortly afterwards, Kate was presented with a golden brooch, apparently from Queen Victoria's personal collection. And that was accompanied by a note expressing the monarch's deep admiration for her work. Establishing the Kate Marsden Leper Fund, she started to amass serious money, both from her speaking and from her writing, and all this money was destined to be sent back to Siberia. She repeatedly expressed that her intention was to come back here herself to help run the leprosarium, which by this point was already being built. And here it is. These are the buildings that were built to help the lepers here in Villawisk, thanks to the efforts and work of Kate Marsden. She was on course to achieve everything that she had set out to do, to realise a huge ambition. So why have I never heard of her? Okay. The criticism began before she'd even got back to London. At first, it was perfectly legitimate questions raised by very credible publications. The British Medical Journal claimed that the herb had already been extensively analysed and found to be completely useless. It also questioned the need for her work, saying that raising such funds and going to such effort for such a relatively small number of people, maybe as few as 60 lepers, was totally unnecessary. They raised the good point that the British Empire had plenty of people suffering from leprosy within its own domain and that the Russian Empire, one of the richest in the world, was perfectly capable of looking after its own. Over time, this criticism developed into asking whether, as well as unnecessary, her journey might have been hugely exaggerated. People suggested that the travelling hadn't been nearly as far or as arduous as she made out. Eventually, they accused her as being an outright liar and that the whole thing had been a hoax. But by far the loudest criticism came from the New Zealand press. She'd originally earned their antagonism by claiming in an interview that she had tended to leprous Maoris while on the South Island of the country. New Zealand took this 
as a slur on their nation, claiming that there had never been leprosy in New Zealand, not amongst the European or the Maori population. And they were right, leprosy has never been there. So maybe Marsden was lying, or maybe she'd just been mistaken. But either way, the New Zealand press started raking over her time in the colony, and they came up with tabloid gold. There were whiffs of insurance fraud. She'd had an accident at work in very dubious circumstances, shortly after taking not one, but two insurance policies out. Gossip gathered pace as it emerged that Marzen had left a trail of debts right the way across Europe and across Russia too. It turned out that she'd used imaginary estates in New Zealand that didn't exist. Gossip gathered pace when it emerged that she'd left a trail of debts behind her. And there were accusations that much of the money that had been donated towards her new leper fund had instead gone towards funding her travels and her lifestyle. A committee of her friends was set up in St. Petersburg to try and dismiss the rumours and reassert her integrity. So it was a devastating blow when the committee published a letter in the Times saying that all the accusations were entirely true. Marsden tried to fight back and maintained her innocence, but it was useless. Now that there was such a big question mark over her integrity, there was nowhere to go. Marsden tried to fight back, maintaining her innocence, but it was no use. It was the end of the road. Funding dried up and allies became enemies. Only later did the full circumstances of that article in the Times come to light. The author of the article stated privately that they had only confirmed Marsden's financial wrongdoings so that the public would assume it was the greater offence. Greater than what? Greater than what? Well, for reasons known only to Kate Marsden, she had admitted in writing to the committee that she'd had sexual relationships with women. She must have known that an omission like that, at that time, would have meant her ruin. And that proved to be the case. When the news slowly leaked out into the press and to the public, the nurse explorer became a social outcast. If you're anything like me, you're probably feeling a little bit disappointed at this point in the story. Where is Kate Marsden the inspiration riding off into the Tager to make the world a better place? Instead, we're confronted with evidence that can't easily be explained away simply by Victorian homophobia, that Marsden did some pretty terrible things in her past, things that we can't excuse. Instead of looking at Kate the hero, now we're faced with Kate the human. And if we're going to look at Kate Marsden as a human, we need to look right back to where she came from. This was a woman whose story was full early on with some of the realities of life. She was still a child when her father died. And then at the age of 19, so while still a teenager, she was sent to be a nurse in one of the most brutal, bloody wars of the entire century. She would have been faced in that field hospital with gruesome injuries, with evidence of man's brutality with man right in front of her. That's got to have affected her. Then she started to lose her siblings one by one to the family disease, consumption, a disease that she herself also suffered from. Most likely, she considered that her life would not be a long one. This was a woman who, in many ways, didn't have much to lose. Then she would have been coming to terms with her own sexual identity, an identity that her own religion taught her made her an abomination. She was damned anyway, in their eyes. 
And then she would have been coming to terms with her own sexual identity, an identity that at the time her own religion taught her made her an abomination, taught her that she was damned anyway. And now she's making her own way in life. She's responsible not just for herself, but for her mother in a society that put lots of obstacles in the way of any woman that wanted to live from her own independent means, never mind a woman who wanted to chase her own ambitions. Marsden writes of her time in Siberia as living her repentance and sorrow. And if you're someone looking for redemption, Siberia is a pretty good place to come to find it. You're surrounded by the wild taiga. You're surrounded by nature at its most raw. You don't need churches and buildings. The local culture fills nature with spirits. That's where its religion is. I myself have been on long journeys in wild places that have been full of adversity of one form or another. And I've seen how that experience not only has changed the people I've been traveling with, but has changed me too. It changes your perspective, not only on what you're seeing in the world around you, but it changes your perspective of your interior landscape too, what goes on inside your head. So I don't think it's too much of a leap to imagine that Kate Marsden coming here, seeing what she witnessed in the Tega and feeling that she could actually do some good here, maybe that was enough to change her. And when you look at the allegations against her, most of them, if not all, predate her time in Siberia. So perhaps we're looking at a woman that did do bad things in her past, but came here and realized that she could make a difference and at the same time achieve that redemption that she was after. If you read her writings, it's full of a grief, a guilt, a sorrow that she never entirely explains, but which I suspect referred back to things that she'd done in her past that she wasn't proud of. And really, I think that makes her very human. The Marsden story makes us look at the criteria that we set for our heroes and who we choose to raise to that elevation of celebrity. And the reason why that is important is because heroes become role models. And so who we choose to worship as a hero has an effect on the people that come after. And today, all too often, we see how easy it is for people in the public eye who maybe have messed up in one way or another come back and regain their position in society. Back in the Victorian age, as Kate Marsden found out, it wasn't that easy. Once there was doubt on your integrity and your character, that was it, all doors were closed to you. Kate Marsden's writing is full of a sense of guilt and sorrow. So clearly she was hoping that this would be her route to a fresh start a source of redemption, a way of making up for deeds past, but she was never granted that opportunity. At the heart of this story, we're asked to make a decision about whether her achievements here in Siberia allow us to forget the deeds of her past, whether we're allowed to give her that second chance and admire her for what she did here, And of course, by then, the great British public neither remembered nor cared about Kate Marsden. Just 10 years before she died, Kate Marsden wrote a second book. And what she chose to call that book tells you everything you need to know. She called it, My Travels in Siberia, A Vindication. In it, she told her side of the story, decrying what she saw as her vilification. Both her time in Siberia and her excommunication from the project that followed haunted Kate Marsden until the very end. But by that time, the great British public neither remembered nor cared about the nurse that had gone on a mission in Siberia. They may have forgotten about her, but people here in Siberia never did. 
The leprosarium that Kate Marsden worked so hard to make happen was built and was very successful. Even today it's credited for driving leprosy out of Yakutia once and for all and it only shut in the 1960s. And then in the same village they created the Kate Marsden Hospital for Mental Illnesses. Not only that, but in this village, they are building a church that they're going to name after Kate Marsden. There's a museum that tells her story, and not one, but two statues. And this year, it's being rebuilt as a modern facility that is going to serve the entire region for generations to come. Not only that, but in this village, they are building a church that they're going to name after Kate Marsden. There's a museum that tells her story, and not one, but two statues. In this part of the world, to this very day, Kate Marsden is used to inspire new generations to change the world around them for the better. That's an enviable legacy by anyone's standards. And yet there's more. In 1894, Kate Marsden helped to establish the St. Francis Leprosy Guild in London. And that's an organisation that is still operational today, working worldwide to rid humanity of leprosy once and for all. Spending time here in Yakutia, where the memory of Kate Marsden is treated with such respect, reverence and gratitude, I can't help but wonder if she could see this would she feel that she finally had got her vindication?